Paul Dauenauer is today's speaker for the CO2 research talks. Uh, Paul is a professor in the uh, Chemical Engineering and Material Science Department uh, at University of Minnesota. Uh, he's, uh, um, his work in a variety of different areas, including catalysis uh, and uh, reaction engineering. Uh, he worked um, in um, uh, different fields, including biomass conversion, and uh, more recently started working in uh, programmable catalysis, uh, being the leader of the Center for Programmable Energy Catalysis, which is one of the energy frontier research centers funded by the Department of Energy in the United States. Um, a long list of accolades, I would uh, just um, uh, point out one in particular, Paul is a MacArthur Fellow, which is one of the um, highest distinctions for not just scientists, but in general, um, geniuses uh, in the United States and beyond, uh, which is something that happens in the catalysis community uh, more rarely than once in a blue moon and really is a, uh, testifies the creativity and the impact of the work that Paul has done. Paul has started several startup companies, including Carba, that is highlighted here in his slide, that is working on uh, sequestering uh, billions of tons of carbon through a process that Paul will likely be sharing with us today. Uh, so um, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us today. We're very excited to hear about um, your solution to uh, carbon sequestration and CO2 capture. And uh, we'll look uh, forward to uh, discussion after your presentation. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, so I will be talking about my research at the University of Minnesota, but also as part of CARBA, as Matteo was referring to. So throughout, you'll see um, the CARBA logo because I'm, I'm, I'm a co-founder of that company as well. I also have a lot of these QR codes throughout with links to some of the papers I'm talking about. And there's a couple that you might want to grab in terms of data. There's the, usually the link written below, but but that's just a quick way to get the link if you want to see what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't think I need to talk about this too much with this group because they're they're well aware of it. The the of course the problem being that CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas uh, CO2 equivalents emissions have gone up dramatically in the past century, and that's warming the planet along with many other impl uh, implications for the world. And <clears throat> at the same time. The temperature is rising, and this has all of these particular problems with sea level rise, uh, the change in climate for agriculture, um, and all sorts of associated problems of which the potential impact has been estimated in uh, up to $100 trillion in 2018 uh, net present value equivalent over the next century. So an incredible cost associated with dealing with this uh, if we do nothing. And the goal, of course, is to address this problem with this significantly less cost and disruption to society. Um, so like I said, the cost here is is dramatic. If we do nothing, uh, the, the, the impact will be so large uh, that we'll wish we had done something in the past. And luckily right now we are in the past of future impl uh, implications and we still have an opportunity to do something. I think every year that goes forward, we, we have this target of where we want to get to. Is it 1.5 degrees C or 2 degrees C um, above historic temperatures, uh, mean temperatures? And then where we're going to be able to get to depends on how quickly we can develop technology and policy that addresses this problem. And again, I don't think this, this group of people needs to hear about this as much because this is the mission of your organization. Uh, so what do we have to get to in terms of targets? I'm an engineer. Engineers love targets and plans and, and uh, tasks and all these kind of things. So if you look at where we are now around two, uh, 2020, uh, CO2 emissions are approaching 40 billion uh, tons per year, but other greenhouse gas emissions or CO2 equivalents are in the mid 50s and approaching 60. And there's all sorts of different projections that people have of where we'll get to. Uh, this projection by the United Nations uh, that was published in the National Academy of Science uh, uh, report says that we could get up to 70 billion tons if we do nothing. That's the business as usual scenario. Now, one scenario they looked at was the idea that we could Im Im immediately start replacing uh, greenhouse gas emitting technologies with uh, alternative carbon free technologies and reduce our CO2 emissions with the goal of keeping it below two degrees C mean temperature change by the end of the century. Now, the problem there being that we can reduce CO2 emissions with alternative technologies, 
but we still have, of course, over a century of CO2 emissions, as well as some difficult to uh, abate CO2 emission technologies. And so when people say, do we need carbon dioxide removal technologies, there's no way to get to net zero in all likelihood by the end of the century without some sort of carbon dioxide removal technology. And the scale of that is quite large. So we're talking right now, we emit CO2 of about 30 to 40 billion tons. By the end of the century, we need to get to 20 billion tons of CO2 removal to be on track for net zero emissions. So decarbonizing power generation is, of course, number one. It's the biggest fish. It's the most important uh, target. How do we remove CO2 from energy generation? And for people that haven't seen this before, I think if you're younger, you don't realize that in, in when I was a student, the idea that solar and wind could be low cost was um, uh, not considered a reality. And it wasn't clear it would ever happen. And so to me, it's shocking to see plots like you see here on the left where solar uh, back even after I was a student, was dramatically more expensive than conventional fossil fuel power. And now, depending on where you implement it, how you implement it, it can be even cheaper than natural gas, uh, which is pretty shocking. So the challenge being, of course, how do we implement this with our current energy system, which is based on baseload power from a, a steady supply of energy? And one way to do this potentially is to convert wind and solar to uh, carbon-free or carbon-zero uh, fuels, such as methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, these types of things. And of course, people have been saying this for a long time. I'm the director of a center, uh, the D Center for Programmable Energy Catalysis, and this is what we focus on, the catalytic technology to store wind and solar energy as liquid fuels. Uh, but of course, the, the, the other question I want to talk about today is the second uh, order problem is how do we remove 10 to 20 billion tons per year of CO2 and CO2 equivalent? And a lot of people have been working this from, for, for decades, much longer than I've been working on it. And they've come up with all sorts of creative solutions to do this. And again, I, I assume that many people in this organization have heard of all of these. Uh, and so ideas of removing uh, coastal blue carbon rock weathering, forming carbonates uh, from rocks, direct air capture of pulling CO2 out of the air using uh, adsorbents or absorbents, uh, carbon capture at, at emission points, that's CCS, that's different than carbon dioxide removal, but it's a, it's a core part of what people do. There's ideas of reforesting and using that biomass to store the carbon, storing carbon in soil, or taking plants and turning it into carbon and putting that in either topsoil as biochar or underground as buried torrified carbon. Now, we can look at all of these as options and, of course, do an assessment of which one here makes the most sense in terms of the economics, but also the permanence of how much CO2 you remove. Um, so which ones are we going to focus on? Uh, you know, of course, we have to assess all of them, but how do we look at each of these and make head-to-head -head comparisons is the question. Uh, if you look at a technology that's that's growing very quickly, this is called enhanced rock weathering, where you take volcanic rock break it down into small uh, particles, spread it on fields, and then the falling rain absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere, it reacts with the volcanic rock, and then the carbonates uh, are stored permanently in such a way that that CO2 is removed in a way that's faster because we've increased the surface area and distribution of these types of materials. And of this, of course, this has a significant benefit that at the end of the day, we're doing things we're already good at as a society, taking rocks, breaking it down, spreading it out. These are all technologies we have. Um, direct air capture is another approach where you can take air, uh, blow it over sorbents or uh, um, absorbents, different types of things, using membrane technologies, another version of this, and recovering CO2 as a purified stream, at which point you have to do something with that, such as use it under, uh, pump it underground, convert it into something else. Uh, this technology has been around a very long time. It has many challenges that if we could overcome them, this would be fantastic. Uh, it's very high capital. If you've seen a picture of this, I'll show you one later. It's a big piece of steel. Um, it uses a lot of energy, which is a problem in the sense that uh, we're trying to abate the CO2 removed from energy. And number three, it's very expensive. And we'll talk about the prices a little bit here. Uh, reforestation is another approach that people have been pursuing. Uh, and the idea being very simple, we have areas that uh, have very little organic material. If we plant significant amounts of forest, that CO2 in the atmosphere by photosynthesis will, will result in solid carbon in the form of lignocellulose, and that will store CO2 um, in some form. Now, there's many problems with this one. This one has been particularly problematic in my assessment of, of, of carbon dioxide removal for many reasons. Number one is it's not long-term due to the carbon cycle. 
uh, biomass that's grown will fall on the ground, decompose, and re-emit. And uh, the, the level of permanence that people are looking for in carbon dioxide removal credits is on the order of 100 to 1,000 years, whereas this will be even less than that. But the even bigger problem here is that it's difficult to verify. How do you know how much CO2 is removed and for how long? And this has made this approach generally uh, not recognized, in my opinion, as a solution to the problem. Uh, there's all sorts of other ideas. One idea is you could take that biomass, instead of letting it it uh, grow over time and uh, die and decompose, you could take it and you could liquefy it. So you can use a technology called fast pyrolysis to turn solid wood into a liquid brown uh, material you see right there, and then you could pump that underground. Now, this is a very interesting idea in the sense that we're, we're very good at handling liquids, converting materials and you can convert these uh, solid materials to a liquid at low cost. The biggest risk here is, is that a lot of these liquids, if you've ever smelled liquid smoke cooking material, that's a diluted form of this type of pyrolysis oil. It's very intense odor, and it's listed as carcinogenic. So even here, you can see it's got a health label of three. So what worries me a bit about this approach would be bi creating billions of tons of carcinogenic water-soluble liquids. So I'm not uh, excited about this possibility. Um, so I think the, the question, I've shown you just a few options there. The big question is, can carbon dioxide removal become sustainable? And we look at all the metrics of sustainability, the, the green metrics that we use for assessing uh, process technology. And I think that the second part of this, of course, is even if it's sustainable, can carbon dioxide removal become a viable business, which is something that we care a lot about if we want to implement this on the billion ton scale because we'll need the ability to do financing, we'll need the ability to do fundraising, and we'll have to pay people, uh, implement this at, in terms of an entire business to make it actually happen. Um, so I, you know, this is a part where, where if, if we were in, in a live audience, I would probably ask you this, but I want you to think about this particular question. How much more would you pay for a round trip flight from New York to Los Angeles to offset 100% of the carbon emissions just associated with your ticket? So if you buy a ticket, whatever you think it costs. So uh, I looked this up recently, the, the full ticket price to go from round trip New York to LA is about 335 to $520, depending on when you do it and, and all that. Um, and so would you pay $25, $50, $100, 250 or whatever it takes? I want This is what I want you to think about because th these types of assessments are what help us think about what people would actually be willing to pay to offset the carbon emissions of what they do. I didn't put even put zero here as an option here. So I'm assuming that you're going to you're going to pay something for this. So keep in mind this number that you're thinking you would be willing to pay as we move forward here, because I think this helps really um, make this feel like a real um, economic metric and not just something we've calculated in a spreadsheet. So uh, people are paying for this right now. It's not that carbon dioxide removal is in the research phase. It is in the research phase still, but it's also in development. And there are actually people selling credits, including our company. So here's a, a recent example. Uh, um, JP Morgan makes one of the biggest bets ever on carbon dioxide removal. Um, and you can see here they've invested, uh, the bank will purchase credits tied to the removal of 800,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide from several startups, including paying more than 20 million to Climaworks. Climaworks is one of the leading uh, companies in direct air capture. Climaworks will remove 25,000 metric tons over nine years. So you take $20 million, divided by 25,000 tons, that's, that's we don't know their, their contract details, but if we just take these numbers and average them all, that works out to about $800 per ton. So if we back up a slide, um, it, you emit about one ton of CO2 in this round trip flight, would you pay $800 extra to offset the CO2? And the I think nobody would do that. That feels economically unreasonable. But it's also where not where director capture is going to be forever. The idea right now is that it is more expensive. It might not even be $800 per ton. We don't know the details of their contract, but it needs to be significantly less than that uh, to be viable as a product. Um, and I think in general, we know that the costs of a, 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 several technologies of carbon dioxide removal are currently too high. And you can see if you go to the, the link at the bottom right there or, or click on the with your phone with the QR code, you can actually go see what prices people are paying for this right now. And you can see all sorts of different approaches and what people are willing to pay. Now, why are they paying different prices? Because the permanence and verifiability of these different technologies is significantly different. The ability to determine what's been done and track it 
verify it, and the amount of energy they each take in terms of, of capturing CO2 per ton uh, is significantly different. So this is already from back in May. But you can see some technologies do get down in the $200 to $300 range, uh, where others are significantly higher. So what price, uh, a carbon price can we afford or what can we tolerate? Obviously, if, if certain technologies emit more CO2, uh, such as flying uh, versus cars, buses, domestic rail coach, uh, trains, those kinds of things, we're going to have to pay more because we're emitting more, of course. So it's obviously proportional. Um, so if people are talking about carbon dioxide removal prices of $100 to $1,000 per ton, that order of magnitude, you can think of it this way. If you just take the carbon uh, in a gallon of gasoline, I don't know what it is per liter. I'm sorry for my European friends here. Um, I don't know how many liters per gasoline. I should probably know offhand. But but that adds about uh, $1 per $10 per gallon of gasoline. And Americans pay about uh, 3 to $4 gallon, dollars per gallon. So if, it, if we can get carbon dioxide removal down to $100 per ton, we're asking people to pay about 20% more for their gasoline, which is starting to sound viable. Nobody likes to pay anything more for it, but but uh, asking people to pay 200% more is not a viable solution. And that's why we're in the ballpark of a viable cost here and the economics matter so much uh, to make this viable. We just need to get it probably a little bit cheaper down in that $100 to $200 per ton range to make this viable on a mass scale. So of course the problem here, if if you've taken my uh, thermodynamics course or any thermodynamics course, you know that, that CO2 has essentially an entropy penalty. This is a, a plot here from this, this recent book where you're looking at the minimum amount of work it takes to take CO2 out of the air and, and um, uh, um, uh, accumulate it as a pure stream. And you can see it, it that's a function of the mole fraction of CO2. So obviously, if the mole fraction of CO2 is very high, it takes very little work. And as you get more and more dilute, the amount of energy it takes to separate this in theory, the absolute minimum amount of work goes up dramatically. And that's the problem with CO2 in the air. It's about 400 ppm, and it takes a lot of energy. Whereas something like carbon capture, using a high concentrated CO2 stream uses less energy. And this is the idea of the entropy penalty and why it's difficult to do carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere versus carbon capture from a from a, a stream an, an energy generation point. So uh, this is the problem. Carbon dioxide removal uses energy, and we're trying to create carbon dioxide removal technologies to abate energy generation with fossil fuels. And the problem is capture of CO2 requires more energy than the minimum amount due to the inefficiency of the process. So we were showing on the previous slide, if I back up here, about 20 kilojoules per mole of CO2 in the theoretical minimum, and we're using far more than that. I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, of course, then you have to do something with it as well. Sequestration of CO2 is a compressed product uses significant energy as well or conversion of CO2 to other fuels uses an incredible amount of energy. So what, what, how are we gonna essentially offset the energy uh, emissions if we're using a lot of energy in the process is a particular challenge with carbon dioxide removal. And I know people say we can use uh, renewable energy, but does it make sense to instead use renewable energy just to offset fossil fuels? At some point there's a crossover where it makes sense to use renewable energy to offset fossil fuels versus direct air capture. And so the entropy penalty, it's a huge energy problem. Uh, you can see here, this is a picture from the National Energy Technology Laboratory of one of these ideas of a direct air capture technology where you're blowing air over a sorbent of some type um, to capture 10 billion tons per year with, with direct air capture with the numbers that you see here, would use 100 exajoules of energy per year, or one sixth of the world's electrical energy usage. Um, Using these numbers as well to, to build these technologies would be about $15 trillion in capital. And then, of course, we still need to do something with the CO2. And so I'm not saying this technology can't be some improved. I know there's a lot of ideas to make this technology better. Where we are right now, we can't scale this uh, without a huge cost and challenge in making it happen. That's the problem. Um, so what we would like instead if, is if we could improve this technology. Can we make a direct air capture alternative that powers itself? Uh, possibly looks good. I mean, this doesn't look particularly good. Like I wouldn't want this dotted all over the Minneapolis and Minnesota landscape if I could avoid it. It just doesn't look good. Um, has zero capital cost. I don't want to pay for all this steel. Can we generate alternative versions of itself? So it makes one and then it's like a robot that makes another one and then that makes another one. That would be great. 
Uh, and it goes beyond director capture and reduces CO2 to some degree. So the product isn't CO2, it's some reduced form of it. So, you know, obviously this sounds magical, all of these benefits, and could we make a director capture technology that does it? And this is the, 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 the part where I try to make a joke here, uh, that we've just essentially described a tree. All of these benefits that we're talking about, a tree's power itself, I think they look good. The, the capital cost here is zero because it grows itself. It can generate additional versions of itself as seeds, and it does reduce CO2 to carbohydrates and lignin. So this is what uh, my uh, our team of uh, and myself, led by Andrew Jones, who's a PhD chemical engineer, um, have spent a couple of years studying and trying to figure out what technology makes the most sense and can achieve all of our metrics for carbon dioxide removal. But we're going to let nature do all of the work and overcome this entropy penalty for us. It's gotten really good at doing that on a mass scale. And then we're going to harvest the, the biomass. We're going to uh, torrify it, turn it into this black carbonaceous material, and then we're going to bury it underground. Now, the burial underground is a key part of this. It's very important for the quality of the carbon credits we sell based on the permanence. This has the four key technology characteristics we're looking for, ultra low capital costs, distributed in mobile operations so we can go where the carbon is being captured and bury it where we need to uh, high throughput and high yield so we want to get as much carbon out of the biomass as possible and into the torrified carbon product and long permanence beyond a thousand years with this approach so this is this question i was talking about earlier if we look at the energy requirement to remove a ton of co2 equivalent how much work does it take now we can plot on here certain lines um, that are of interest. So first of all, how much CO2 is emitted per ton of coal? Um, you can see it right here in purple. So if you're above that line, it makes more sense to use renewable energy to offset uh, the coal production rather than to power a DAC system or direct air capture technology or carbon dioxide removal technology uh, because you're, you're, you would be better off in terms of CO2 removal overall by offsetting coal. And obviously something like methane is even gonna be in a better position. Uh, if you take the theoretical minimum amount of work to separate the CO2 that I was talking about earlier and then use a 5% efficiency, that's what this blue line is up here. So you can see it's very difficult with the current technologies to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. Torrefaction is down here because all of the work is done by photosynthesis for us. So torrefaction uses very little energy. It uses some energy to, to move things around and to operate the reactor, but it's far below our target that we're looking for in terms of energy consumption. That's one of its major benefits. And you can you can look at minimum energy requirements here. Of course, that's like I just said on the previous slide, that's very far from the actual performance of real systems because of the efficiency problem. So direct air capture and reduction, like I was saying, it was only 20 kilojoules per mole minimum, theoretically, but that number, we're closer to 20-fold uh, what that number is based on a 5% efficiency. And then you still need a lot of hydrogen or electrical energy to, re to reduce that to something meaningful that we're gonna use. With photosynthesis and torrefaction, almost all of this energy comes from solar power. It's doing the separation for us, it's doing the reduction. And then the torrefaction, if we take a delta H, depending on how you operate this, can vary a little bit. But you can see at the end of the day, the amount of energy requirement here is dramatically lower by photosynthesis and torrefaction. So what we're doing, we take uh, tree waste, or and the amount of waste and uh, lignocellulosic material that's out there is available on the gigaton scale. Uh, whether that's 40 gigatons, 50 gigatons, that's something people are debating and what we include, but it's, a, it's, it's available on the billion ton scale. We take that, harvest and process it, torrify it to some carbon, ship it to some location, and then we bury it and cover it at least two feet underground. And there's all sorts of opportunities for this. So this strategy, this is the general approach we're taking. And you can implement this basically anywhere that there's a place where you can dig a hole, which is very cheap, or, or find a hole, and any place where you can grow biomass, harvest it, and process it. So we put together a team as part of CARBA that's, that's doing this. So I'm a co-founder along with Andrew Jones. Uh, actually, this is Andrew Jones up here on the top right. I have Rob Crane written for some reason. Rob Crane uh, runs Anderson Crane, uh, which does the manufacturing of our reactors. And that's historically what they've done is build reactor type materials. Peter Albright's our, our farmer. Will Langton does our finance. And Linda Hofflander does our strategy and sales. 
So there's a couple of insights here into how we build the reactor. So as an engineer, the reactor is the part that I focus on, even though the, the, the efficiency of the entire system is what matters. But we'll start with the reactor. There's one particular insight here that's very important for how we get high carbon yields, which is how does cellulose decompose? And this is actually research I was working on uh, more than 10 years ago of how cellulose reacts. Uh, so if you're not a chemist, it's not a big deal. I'll try to explain this very simply. But the blue data here you see on the left is the rate at which cellulose polymers break apart, uh, like you can see over here on the right. And cellulose is made up of a series of, of sugars. And as those sugars break apart, uh, they can make volatile components, which in this case, we don't want. We want solid carbon. And what you can see is at about 467 degrees C, the, the, the mechanism by which cellulose breaks apart shifts and it accelerates dramatically. So you can see you don't want to, if you want to make solid carbon, you don't want to be above this 467 degree transition. And that's why technologies like fast pyrolysis that are deliberately trying to make vapors operate at 500 C. So because they exist in that region where cellulose basically liquefies and falls apart. Uh, we would like to be as close to that as possible without going over with the goal of getting high throughput but not fracturing cellulose and heavy cellulose and these types of materials into vapors. Now, how do you do that? Depends on the heat transfer of your reactor design. So you can think of it, it, of it this way, uh, particles that you put into a reactor, we're talking about things from a millimeter for fast pyrolysis up to significantly larger, one to 10 centimeters for torrefaction, those can only react so quickly. So the reaction time, you can't go faster than the chemistry. So there's a bottom limit here in blue and then you can't go faster than you conduct heat. So you can only really operate in this white region here. And that region at which you operate, most of the existing biochar and torrefaction reactors have residence times up to an hour. And that's because their heat transfer is poor. So the dominant design parameter or design characteristic of a reactor for torrefaction and for fast pyrolysis is heat transfer. Now, that's not a, a terribly novel insight. I mean, you can see you can go about an order of magnitude faster, but an order of magnitude faster means that you can get 10 times higher throughput, which means you can reduce your capital cost by a factor of 10 by going as fast as possible uh, with heat transfer. And so all of the, I'm not going to show you the design of the reactor because it's proprietary. Uh, in fact, the cartoon I showed earlier, that was a, an artist rendition of the reactor. They've never even seen the real reactor, our pilot facility that's operating. Um, but this is the, the general idea, how you get low capital distributed manufacturing. Low size also means we can make a reactor that fits on the back of a truck and can be moved around. Now, what comes out of this, we can process out of these reactors about 45 tons per day. Like I said, because you have incredibly high throughput with uh, the heat transfer characteristics we've talked about, we can get to high temperature without cracking, a significant amount of cracking. And we can move this reactor around with a small footprint. So these uh, reactors are made up of several parts, all of which can be uh, hauled on roads that are designed for forestry applications. So these are not asphalt roads, um, but you can put them deep into a forest. You can process the carbon there, which means you don't have to move the biomass around a lot. They're low cost in the way they're designed. So our partnership with Anderson Crane, who does uh, capital equipment design and manufacturing, has worked with us to figure out how we can get these as low cost as possible. And they're autothermal. So our pilot facility has been operating for almost a year. I should have updated this. Uh, and then we use the exhaust gases that we create to power the entire system. So the question then becomes, if I have one of these reactors, so in this cartoon, again, this isn't what it looks like, but the idea is we can put these reactors all over uh, the world in different locations, and then we can take in whatever waste material is there. Now, I've been talking about trees, but we can take agricultural waste. We can take packaging like paper or cardboard. We can take municipal solid waste residues like grasses and twigs and sort of things like that. There's all sorts of different opportunities. Uh, but of course, what matters here is what are the range of possibilities for how you would bury CO, um, bury torrefied carbons and process lignocellulosic materials. So we build a model where we take in uh, all sorts of different parameters, such as all the different types of lignocellulosic material, its moisture content, uh, how much it costs to chip it, torrefied carbon burial, uh, all those types of parameters that go in. And then out of this, we can take all of the performance metrics for this particular system. We do this for a mass energy model, and then we also do this for a uh, an economic model. And then we simulate this in using a Monte Carlo approach 
to determine what are the distributions of possibilities in these particular um, setups. So I could place these anywhere I want that would change each of these input parameters. Where are the situations that make a lot of sense? So you can see here, looking at a, a whole bunch of scenarios, you can see that if, if I look at the distributions that we put in, we get about 0.81 tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of biomass. Now, this is looking at a range of moisture content with biomass of 10 to 40 weight percent. So something freshly cut or something that's been cut and allowed to dry to some point. And you can see here that's that's good in the sense that we would like to maximize how much carbon we get out of our particular application. There's some situations, particularly the low moisture content ones that are over here in terms of higher net storage. But we're not losing a dramatic amount of carbon in our entire process, which is important. This is the, the key economic metric for the entire process of how much carbon we get out. Um, so here's a, again, this is an artist rendition, but the idea is we can make these this torrefied carbon bury it underground, and we can start using our Monte Carlo economic model to say, well, how much, well, how much does each of these scenarios cost? And you can see here the bulk of the scenarios exist in this range of about 100 to $150 per ton of CO2. Now, that number is important. If you remember back to what we were talking about earlier, we were talking about how much people would pay and what would be the impl implications of carbon dioxide removal in the range of $1 to $200. So that's the range you need to be in where these numbers start to be viable for the general public. And you can see there are some scenarios that are expensive, but 95% of the scenarios here that we've looked at with this approach cost less than $200 per ton, and a quarter of them are under $100 per ton. So there's a lot in this range of $100 per ton CO2 equivalent that are viable for our particular interest. Now, you can you can look at all of the different parameters that go into this and say, well, which ones give me the cheap opportunities? Which ones give me the expensive opportunities? And where are those scenarios? Could we actually implement them in real life? Um, so you can look at each scenario and kind of assess what's contributing and what's not. And there's a couple of things you want to take out of this. So in terms of cost per ton of biomass, you can look at things like what are the input costs? So here's the biomass cost. So we're assuming about $35 per ton of biomass. So we're, so we're actually buying biomass in this particular application. Um, you can see here the, the diesel and moving the biomass and the carbon around is a significant contributor as well. The reactor both here and the equipment that you see right there actually only contribute about $10 in the overall cost of the processing. The capital cost is not the main driver with this technology approach. It's acquiring the biomass and moving it around as the primarily primary driver. Even burying the biomass, digging our own holes and burying it is a, not a significant cost. It's about $10 per, per ton of CO2 equivalent. So biomass is the key uh, uh, cost here and moving it around with trucking and diesel. Uh, and so the, the opportunities that are gonna look really good are places where people are paying us or, or giving the biomass for free. And there's a lot of places that just need to get rid of it, uh, particularly municipal solid waste or I mean, municipalities that need to get rid of like uh, uh, tree clippings or grass clippings or things like that. Cardboard waste, agricultural waste, those types of applications are the number one targets. So uh, in terms of the economic, what matters the most? And this is where we talk about reactor performance. Well, number one, as I said earlier, is carbon yield. How do you get the most carbon out of the biomass that you put in? What is the con carbon content of the material you start with and how much moisture is in it? Almost everything else doesn't contribute as significantly. So if I come back to this, I want you now to envision implementation. By 2050, we need to get to 10 billion tons uh, of CO2 per year. And we're at, in, in terms of the world, thousands of tons of CO2 per year now with all the technologies that are operating. So we're down here in this almost negligible amount of carbon dioxide removal, and we need to move very quickly. Uh, so we can imagine how many reactors would we need to implement around the world to make this happen. And you can see here, we're trying to get into the hundreds of thousands of reactors operating around the world. And you can imagine how many could we put in Minnesota? How many could we put in the United States, North America, Europe, Asia? We can start to imagine this sort of like manufacturing cars. We're going to mass produce these uh, reactors, sort of like we would mass produce a truck or a car. And then these numbers of hundreds of thousands start to seem reasonable if we treat them as something like we're already mass manufacturing. So you could, like I said, you can put these anywhere. You can start to imagine all sorts of applications where right now we're taking these materials and we're essentially either burning them 
or landfilling them, or just a lot of times in agricultural residues, we're either letting them rot in piles or we're just spreading them on fields where they decompose and emit CO2. Those are the best applications, but there's all sorts of other opportunities that become viable when you can actually get economic benefit out of these materials, such as forest thinning, where take the state of California, which would love to get some economic value out of managing the forests to enable them to manage more of the forests and create more jobs. So the last part of this, uh, let me just end with this was, you know, we're talking about carbon dioxide removal, but a big problem with carbon dioxide removal has been verifying what's actually going on. And I have here this tweet that David Ho let me share, which is people love talking about carbon dioxide removal. They don't love talking about um, measurement reporting and verification, which is making sure that we're removing as much CO2 as we want. This is what gives credibility to the credits that we're going to sell and makes the entire market of carbon credits viable. So how do the customers know how much CO2 you captured? Um, how do you communicate the total CO2 you've captured? And how can you the amount of captured CO2 be verified and audited? And this is a big problem because companies already have spent a lot of money on carbon credits that are, have been considered junk, um, particularly the, the people that have been trying to plant trees um, and claim a carbon credit for that. And that's when we were talking about earlier, there's low, low permanence, difficult to verify the amount of CO2 that's been removed. And I think this upsets legitimately for good reason upsets companies that are paying a lot of money to try to drive these technologies and their the, the value of the credits they're buying is low. We would like to create a high value credit for these types of opportunities. So uh, measure, report, and verify. There's a lot of work going on in this area. I'm not an expert in this. That's why we have many people on our team and many advisors in CARBA that help us with these types uh, of approaches to develop them for our particular process. And every pr process is going to require a different sort of verification because it's a different technology and the way the carbon is stored is different. So um, there's a whole ecosystem that's developing between the companies that do the carbon dioxide removal, the markets that share, uh, that, that sell the, 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 the carbon dioxide removal credits, the verification organizations that verify that we've done what we say we do. And then of course the companies purchasing the credits and the advisors helping them identify what makes sense for their particular business. So I just have this slide here because it's, it's pretty amazing how fast this is developing, the different areas of organizations that are, that are that are existing to help people implement these types of markets for carbon dioxide removal. And there's, there's a lot to take in here, but you can see the supply side, the buy side, and the sales sides are developing to help people find um, all, all sorts of different um, carbon credits for their particular interest, their level of permanence, and what they're willing to pay. So this is the part that I think a lot of people are missing in all of this, which is we're talking about 10 to 20 billion tons of CO2 by the uh, by 2050 or the end of the decade. So this market is on order to be at least a trillion dollars by 2050. Now that is about the size of the U.S. military. Um, and by the end of the day, that's assuming, of course, if we get to 10 billion tons, that they're only costing $100 per ton. Um, so, of course, a billion tons times $100, that, that's a trillion dollars. Now, this is not lost on uh, companies that are interested in investment. You can see here, this is a, an interesting substack analysis um, at this link right here, where they're looking at what are already people projecting in terms of what's going to be purchased by 2030, only seven years from now. And if you extrapolate that out to 2050, now we're talking about in the thousand billion ton uh, acquisitions of carbon. Now, I... I, I agree with this assessment. I recently, just last week, wrote an article and posted it online about how people are looking at all sorts of technologies and they're sort of missing the investment opportunity, in my opinion, of carbon dioxide removal technologies based on the scale of what's going to happen. So what's coming, if you use this QR code here, you can find it. If not, I have it on LinkedIn, um, my assessment of what's going on. So um, we work with, with Puro Earth. Uh, that's, there's many companies like this that are working on different types of CO2 removal certificates or quarks. Um, and these pure organizations like Pure Earth and many others, they work to verify and develop standards and procedures to, to ensure that what we're doing is actually re removing the CO2. So they're independent from us and they provide a benefit to people acquiring credits uh, to ensure that, that we're doing what we say we're going to do. So you can see here, this is a picture of our C, uh, CEO of CARBA, Dr. Andrew Jones. He's holding the carbon that we've torrified here. Uh, we're going to take this then material and you're going to bury it underground. And of course, here, the level of permanence is really important for the verification. So I'm, 
a really important point here is that there's a lot of people making biochar, torrified carbons, putting them in topsoil where they do have agricultural benefit. But the problem is the carbon you put in the topsoil is not going to be long-term permanent. It can exist for only as, uh, you could lose as much as 50% or more in a single year, depending on where you put it and the conditions it's in. And so that's not really a viable approach in terms of a carbon dioxide removal credit. And so burial is really important for these applications, both to ensure that the credits we sell are valuable, but also that the verification is viable. So let me end here. Um, I just want to leave you with a few numbers. The voluntary carbon market is projected to be $50 billion plus by 2030. Uh, from almost nothing a few years ago. Um, the goal is to remove up to 10 billion tons by 2050. And like I said, this is a trillion dollar market. And uh, I think the goal is to get into this lower range of $100 per ton of CO2 removal. I think our approach, every analysis we've looked at says our approach has the best metrics in terms of low cost, large volume and scalability, uh, but also a thousand year permanence, which means the credits we're selling should have the highest value in terms of what the consumer is looking for. So let me just leave it here. If you were looking for us, you can just type CARBA, you'll find it into Google. Um, but of course, you know, if there's any questions I can answer now about the company, about the research or any part of this.